Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Paul. My very special guest today, Wendy Darling, is the founder of the Miraculous Living Institute, a personal and professional growth organization. In our conversation today, Wendy and I plan to talk about how to overcome the restrictive notion of thinking that it's too late for me to create the life I want. Surprisingly, this limiting idea not only applies to those people that are growing old, I know people in their 30s and 40s that feel the same way, and Wendy is here to help. I, I, I love this to give you an idea about Wendy. Wendy writes, I know what it's like to keep trying to make life work. I know what it's like to feel empty and lonely. I know what it's like to run out of steam, wonder if my dreams are ever going to come true, and I cannot even imagine how much ice cream, dark chocolate, and boxes of Kleenex I've used throughout the years. Believe me, Wendy knows what it's like to lose confidence in yourself, and she offers very practical advice on how to overcome this. With that, let's enjoy our time with together with Wendy Darling. Wendy, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. I really look forward to our opportunity to chat about creating the miraculous life. It's never too late. <laughs> um, and I'm delighted to be with you today in your audience. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's you know, it, uh, it's a special, special time. You know, we talked about how shows can start off slow and get and get right into it. I want to get right into it. Uh, and so one thing I'm curious about to begin with, Wendy, is I'm curious, what inspired you to write your book, Create Your Miraculous Life? Well, the subtitle actually started out to be the theme of the book. Uh, the subtitle of the book is It's Never Too Late. And I was 69. I wrote this book last year, rapidly seeing that number 70 approaching in my life, which even today just seems a little odd. I don't know how that happened, but it has. And, um, and so deep within me, I knew that there were probably fewer steps in front of me than behind me. And there is still so much I want to be offering, so much I want to be experiencing. And the theme of it's never too late was very much in my face. And I have to admit, it, it was also my mom who was such a wonderful role model in that theme um, because she did, she ended up, she she worked as a home in the home for many, many years, went to college when she was in her late 40s and early 50s, started a career in her 50s. So she taught me it's never too late uh, for a career. And then also she, um, my father passed away very unexpectedly at the age of 56 from a heart attack. And within a few years, my mom remarried and so she also taught me it's never too late for love. In fact, um, she had a beautiful mar second marriage also. And when Ted, my stepfather, passed away at the age of 82, she welcomed love in for the third time. So um, she was quite the example in a lot of ways. And so the theme of it's never too late was personal to me, but also we were in the midst of a pandemic. So many lives have been so dramatically affected by it. And um, I felt that the timing was really relevant more than ever before. And it was actually my publisher, Robin Simons of Crescendo Publishing, who also happens to be my best friend. We were having a conversation early on and I said, I know there's more to, it doesn't seem like it's never too late is the title. And in her wonderful way, she reminded me that six years before, five years at that point, I had written my first book that is titled The Miracle That Is Your Life and changed my business name to the Miraculous Living Institute. And so she said, I really think 
your book needs to have something about miracles in it. So that's why it's called Create Your Miraculous Life. It's never too late. However, I will say that when I was in that position, my life at that time was feeling very unmiraculous. My son became very ill last year. And as you might imagine, I was doing everything that I had to do and everything that I could drop, I did. And I'm happy to say I'm cautiously optimistic he's doing much better now. But here I felt so strongly led to actually write this book at a time. I seem to put myself in these positions of (laughs) where I have to really dig deep and find that place within me as well of a miraculous life. Is that really possible? Is it possible that I can feel hope again and believe in, in life becoming, you know, a life of happiness and gratitude and feeling blessed? And so that's how this book got birthed. But uh, it was my first book I wrote in a little under five weeks part time. This book, this book took longer. I think in a lot of ways it was first therapy for me. Yeah, I you know I got a sense of that as I read through the book. I, I, I had an opportunity to read most of the book, and 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 I did in in intuit that as I was reading it. You know, I've got a I've got a a quick story about it's never too late. I was um, I was I was in business and then sort of in the. 70s and I was in my 20s and in my and at 30 years old I came face to face with Jesus and sort of had a spiritual reawakening or awakening and two years later I decided to go to seminary and I was 32 years old and I had um, not finished my college degree so I had to kind of go to college and seminary at the same time and I discovered as looking at different seminaries that I would have to do about five years of study. And, and I said, ah, I'm not going to be 30. I'm going to be 38 when this is over. You know, I'm, it's almost too late. And a friend of mine who had, um, who had changed careers at 45 told me, Charlie, you're going to be 38 anyway. Why not be 38 <laughs> doing what you want to do? Wendy, that just that just struck me. That was that was a, it was a great line. It really is, and and I really do believe in every fiber of my being that no matter what, it's never too late. If there's something that you really desire in your heart, I believe our desires are placed within us when we come into this world. And it's kind of our inner GPS, kind of this carrot that dangles in front of us that has us continue to move forward and to grow, to evolve, to contribute, to enjoy life. Um, and so if, something, if you really want something, if you feel that desire in your heart, it is your truth. And I don't care what your circumstances are, what your age is. I know it's possible, but what happens a lot of times is life kind of dimmers the fire, dimmers the desire, and so what people like myself do is we dust you off in our own unique ways and get you back on track and close that gap from where you are to where you want to be. How do you know where you want to be? You know, I think that is the question. So many people that I that I will speak with, not the people that I'm, well, some of the people that I coach, but not the people, most of the people I'm coaching, but, you know, that is the question. How do I determine what I want to be and who I want? You know, I, I have certain, certain familial obligations or certain work obligations or certain personal obligations, but I still don't know my overall mission and vision, which I know you stress in your book. Uh, How do people come about finding that out, Wendy? What what is that all about? Yeah, well, first of all, I have a process that I take people through. And you just tipped on a little bit where we 
I, I help bring out those desires, those dreams, and we do create a vision in, in an overarching vision with specific categories of your life. And I, I think it's great if you want to have a house that overlooks the ocean as one of your dreams, um, but I take things a step further. Why? What's your mission of wanting that home? What's your mission in life? Because I believe it gives us deeper meaning and purpose for every choice, every decision that we make makes a big difference when we get to that place. Now, in my case, using the same example, I do. I am one of those people that my vision is to have a home that overlooks the ocean. Now, am I, do I live in that home at this point in time? I do not. It's my next home. However, when I created that vision, I was living in Dallas, Texas. I now live in San Diego, and I have a very nice home, but um, I'm not quite there yet. However, my mission and reason, the deeper meaning and purpose of wanting that home is not just to say, ooh, I have it. It's twofold. First of all, my home environment is very important to me because it nourishes me. And in the type of work that I do, you as well, um, I want to be my best. And so I need to be in an environment that nourishes me so that I can be my best when I'm working with my clients. Secondly, when I have that home, even where I am right now, it's telling me I'm getting my job done. I believe we all have what I refer to as a divine destiny. It's, it's the path we take and the journey we're on, and, and it's the target of the end target of our life so that we're at the end of our life, we can look back and give ourselves a good pat on the back saying, hey, I did a good job. And, and so even though I'm not in that optimal home, I think you might agree that I'm a whole lot closer to that living in San Diego than I was in Dallas, Texas. So it tells me, hey, keep going. You're doing great. That's nice. It's, you know, you, 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 you find intermittent successes and that grow to your next success and absolutely and and i think i'm sorry no go ahead i think that's so important and and it's lacking a lot of times in in, in a lot of people you know we all have busy lives we're involved in many different things and I don't know what your desk maybe looks like, but right now my desk, I'm, I'm juggling a couple of projects to say the least. And, um, and I think, you know, we don't take to t the time to say, wow, great progress today. You know, I did this, this, and this. And I start my day saying, okay, what's my intention for the day? What do I need to get done? What would be nice if I got done, you know, and, and at the end of the day, to be able to say, nice, um, or maybe, oh, I sure fell short on getting thing X and Y done. So it's really important to honor your steps. They don't all have to be leaps. And progress of any kind is still progress. And I know a lot of times I see people that are just wanting things to happen really fast. They don't enjoy the journey. And actually, because they're trying to push it as opposed to allow things to unfold more organically, I find people are less productive as opposed to more productive. Absolutely. We are in a, we are in a, we have this kind of little thing we've been saying on the podcast for a little bit and I've been writing about in my blogs. And that is patience, the value of patience. And I don't mean patience with another person who is inconveniencing me, but patience in life. And, and I have, uh, I, I write a lot about and talk about the slow work of God. We'll do our prayers and say our, say our whatever we say with God. And we're expecting like 24-hour, 48, 30-day answers. 
and they could be year long answers. They they you know or longer or yeah, precisely yeah they could be very longer, but very much longer. But that doesn't mean that God is not at work, and it's just that your desire is not right for right now. But it is it is it is good to hang on to that. And I like your use of desire. Um, we did another show that talked about desire that all of us, uh, deep in, inside of us, before we're anything else, we are a burning ball of desire. That's the way we are created. We, we are created to desire things. And, and, you know, certainly there are healthy things to, to desire and certainly not so healthy and, and destructive things to desire. And as we make those distinctions... And we go toward those healthy things. I believe, and it sounds like with you, that we can live our most fulfilled life if we are if we're accomplishing or ad- achieving sort of underlying undercurrent desires that that bring us pleasure in this wonderfully created world. Would would you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. I think our desires truly point us in the direction of our truth. And if we kind of follow that path, it's going to lead us all in living a much happier and fulfilled life. Um, It doesn't mean that everyone's going to be, um, (laughs) well, just yesterday, you know, the Jeff Bezos and Captain Kirk launch, you know, yeah, not everybody's yeah. going to go into outer space or invent a Tesla or whatever it may be. But the satisfaction that you can get, maybe your divine destiny is being somebody in your family that contributes and supports in some way. It doesn't necessarily mean even it's going to be your job. So I think as we look for what I refer to as the miracles in life, for the blessings in life, it leads us to feel more grateful. And when we are feeling more grateful, that brings in itself a very rich experience. And and that has very little to do with status or money or possessions. It's it's just the blessings of and the gift of being alive and being able to do whatever. And I think our world could maybe benefit just a little bit more these days from a little more of that perspective. I agree. I'm I'm you know, I study philosophy ever so little. You know, I, I I read it, but I don't. But but I'm not, you know, a student of philosophy. But I read some philosophy mm-hmm. a lot, and um, you know, Stoicism is very popular these days with a, with a lot of people. And I I love Stoicism. I I love the disciplines of Stoicism. I I think it has a very practical out view of life. But I'm also what would seem like its mirror image is I'm Epicurean. And Epicurus believed in pleasure in life. Now, he's been bastardized in these centuries with all these orgies and drinking and all, and that was not Epicurus at all. Epicurus lived in sackcloth and thought pleasure in life was a was a, a barrel full of potatoes and a glass of wine. But but he believed in pleasure in life, and I I, I really do believe in pleasure in life. I think. In the beginning of one of the liturgies of the Eucharist, it says, um, O gracious God, Heavenly Father, in your infinite love, you created us for yourself. And then it goes on to talk about the cross and all. But just that sentence is wonderful, is it not? In the beginning, or no, in your infinite love, you created us for yourself. You created us for pleasure with yourself that you could give love, you could receive love, and that that love would be the guiding principle of all. And I I just, you know, I do Eucharist daily, and um, every time I read that line, I have to stop and pause. In your infinite love, you created us for yourself, because that is all about desire. And I think what you're also saying is really important. In my world, it's all about love. 
Oh, mine too. I think that love is truly the hub for everything. The love of ourself, our love, however it's expressed um, in your spirituality or religion, the love of a spouse, a significant other, children, family, friends, the relationship and love that you have with your work, with your career, and even the love, the loving relationship you have with money and finances, and of course, the very intimate relationship that is so very important, the love and relationship that you have with your body and to do what you can to keep this gift of a body going so that we can do everything else. Well, Faith, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a really insightful sort of complete definition of love that it, it, it's, it's expanded from either romance or it's either romantic or it's spiritual biblical and, we kind of understand the romantic, but we don't understand the bi- biblical and spiritual meaning of love. I've, I've studied the Eastern Christian mystics, and um, they, they are about love, but it's a whole different form of love than what we talk about. And, and, and it, it's more practical and everyday, and as you explained it, and, and I think that was a great explanation um, and if I could take please. it even a step further, um, there, is, there was a 30-year study conducted by Dr. David Hawkins, uh-huh. and he concluded his research um, in a book called Power Versus Force. And what I love about his body of work is he spent time testing and measuring different feelings and how they had a certain frequency in the feeling. So let me explain a little bit further what that means. There's an energy to an emotion. So in his levels of energetic frequency, shame, for example, is one of the lowest level emotions in terms of measuring it of energetic so then, and as you can imagine, think, don't think hard um, or feel it much, but shame, it, you know, your energy can immediately go down. You, you feel that embarrassment, that shame. And then there are emotions of anger, frustration, sadness, and then he'll have kind of a neutral place in his, um, in his uh, measurements, and then it keeps going up. Um, and love in his in his study was one of the highest emotions that we could experience energetically. Now, this is the part that I found beyond fascinating and very grateful for, is he discovered that if I or you or whomever is coming from a place of love, feeling love, expressing love, we can powerfully affect other people in the lower levels of emotion. And I don't have all the numbers in front of me right now. I actually bring it out in my talks very often. And I teach this not only to adults but youth. Um, For example, when I speak to high school kids or or junior high, middle school children, You know, I I address the issue of what they refer to as bullies, and I tell them, you know, these people that you're these people that you're calling bullies, they are actually people whose hearts have just been totally Mm -hmm. stomped on, Mm -hmm. and they've really been hurt, and this is the only way they have figured out how to survive. And what you can do is you can literally silently, and this, by the way, has been proven, and I've done it myself, you can silently send love to that person because their love well is empty, and you can fill it up. And I have seen example and over example, and I even have ways to demonstrate how this works. And I don't remember the percentages or the numbers that Dr. Hawkins 
uh, states. But if I'm coming from love, I can even can impact thousands of people at a time. So I will sit in my office. I will imagine that I'm filling myself up with love. And then I send it out into my office, my home, my neighborhood, my city, my state, my country. And then I imagine just pouring it out to the entire earth. And if more of us could do that, all this hatred and frustration, and i uh, that's all the adjectives I'll use for today, that we <laughs> are witnessing in our country and our world could possibly squelch that. We can possibly begin to transform that. I know another person personally, his name's James Twyman. He literally goes into war zones and prays. He has his community, who knows how large it is, and they pray at the same time. They share love at the same time to try to influence peaceful resolution. So there really are some very interesting ways that we can contribute to our world getting to be better. And especially, we haven't talked about this, but especially after my accident, and I'm happy to share that at any point, my world changed dramatically where I am highly sensitive. I see energy. It's how I work very specifically with my clients to see where those stuck points are. And we are able to put people, I'm able to put people back in alignment and train their brain so that's working for them as well. So at any rate, that is a very simple way that we can make a positive impact and change. I want to elaborate on that in a bit more, but I, I want to take a step back because I think there's a very important question to ask you. And, you know, you, you intentionally, you, you originally intended on focusing this book on It's Never Too Late, but then you mm-hmm. created over to the Miraculous Life. And, and you, you stated in your book, you are now in the miracle business. What, <laughs> what in the world does the miracle business, I mean, are you... Are you walking on bathtub water or? (laughs) Don't I wish. (laughs) No, I'd like to tell you how this actually happened. So as I mentioned, um, my first book, I worked with my publisher who happens to also be my best friend. I had a client. I referred to her. And even though Robin and I were friends for quite some time, I had never, and I knew what she did, but I didn't really know what she did. And so um, because my client was going to have a strategy session with her, I was invited to be a part of that. And at the end of this, I remember looking at Robin saying, I want you to do that with me. She just has a gift of pulling out what is wanting to be expressed in your book. So we finish our strategy session. We've got paper up all over the room. We have Post-it notes all over the place. But I, I, my, my book is organized, and Robin looks at me and says, so what do you think the title of your book might be? And I'm a very intuitive person, and I felt this pull to this one sheet of paper, and I find myself telling Robin the story that I'm about to tell you right now. So I happen to have been raised Jewish, and in Judaism, when a child is born, they're given a Hebrew name. And a lot of times it's, it's a name honoring somebody who is deceased. So my son Adam was born, and about two years prior to that, my father passed away. And I, it was such a loss and a heartache for me. And, of course, I wanted to honor my father. And my father's Hebrew name was Nissen, and... Nissen means miracle. And so when my son was born, we also wanted to honor uh, my former husband's grandfather, who had also recently passed away. His name was Charles, and in Hebrew that is Chaim, and that translates to life. So my son's Hebrew name is Nissen Chaim, 
which translates to the miracle of life. And I know that you're a parent I and possibly a grandparent at this point. I am a parent and grandparent is at this point. But when I held my son for that very first time, even though biologically I knew how this happened, I knew how it happened, and I kept staring at him, and in my brain I kept saying, how did this happen? Yeah, and yeah. and when the rabbi said the translation to Adam, my son's Hebrew name, that was the miracle of life, I went, oh my gosh, I talk about chills from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. So that was my first book. And because of it, at that time, I changed my business name to the Miraculous Living Institute. And I changed my process that I use with my clients to the Miraculous Living Method. And quite honestly, I, I, at first, I wasn't really comfortable with that. I'm like, what? The miracle person. But I have to say, at some point, I realized that I was actually being guided to be a voice for what's possible and that life can truly be miraculous. Very early in my second book is a quote by Albert Einstein. And, the, and what he says is there are two ways to look at life. Either life there, nothing is a miracle or everything is a miracle. Yeah. And I think when we start putting on the lenses of that perspective, suddenly life can look a little different. It doesn't mean that the waters have to part kind of miracle. It could be, you know, a couple years ago, because my dad died so at such an early age of a massive heart attack, you know, obviously that was a concern of mine. Now I'm 70 and I'm blessed for every day and year that I've had past that 56 mark. I A couple years ago, I had another test, and this time I had an echocardiogram. And I literally got to see my heart in action, which I had, I had had other tests previously, but not that. And that little sucker just works like crazy. It, it's like it's running a 24-7 marathon, and that is no exaggeration. It changed my perspective in that instant. Even till to today, I'm like, Oh, my gosh, I had no idea to the extent that you work each and every day. And it became even that much more important for me to take care of it. So to answer your question, it wasn't by choice consciously that I found myself. If you would have asked me as a little girl a hundred different things, hey, who do you want to be when you grow up? I'm pretty sure miracle would not have been in that in that list in any way, shape, or form. But given our our life right now, given the struggles that a lot of people are going through, wouldn't it be nice? Because I believe it's true that anything truly is possible, and I have been able to decode the ways to allow that to happen. That's great. We are, we are in, in one minute, we're going to take a break, but I have a question first, Paul. I'm warning my producer. You have a question that, that I determine is a coach's question, and it's, a, it's an excellent coach, coach's question, but what I want to do is turn the tables and ask you this excellent, excellent coach question of yourself. What still lives in your heart that you deeply desire to experience in the future? Do you want me to answer that right now? Yeah, yeah, but let's make it more on the brief side so we can go to break. Okay, no problem. I, ha I do not feel that I have contributed enough and reached enough people to support them. That is a deep, deep desire of mine still. I... I I am not used up. I know a lot of people my age, your age, have chosen to retire, and I think that's wonderful. I can't imagine it. 
That's my deepest desire. Yeah, golfing. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> no. I'm not no. a golfer. Yeah. <laughs> but there are other things I enjoy. Um, but I have a bur- I I can feel it still. I have a burning desire to reach many, many, many more people that can most benefit from what I have to offer. Well, keep it up. Let's let's take a break and we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Hi there, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to the next chapter with Charlie. And my very special guest is Wendy Darling, who has written a book, uh, Creating, Create, is it Creating or Create? I, I'm, I'm looking at my... It's create. Yeah, Create Your Miraculous Life. It's Never Too Late. I love the It's Never Too Late piece of it. This is not... You, you know, you encourage the reader to not think that you're you're totally on your own on this. That you are you're creating this all all by yourself. It's a cooperative. And in the forward to your book, um, your your you, the writer of your forward, Adam Markle, writes, "What you want wants you. What you want wants you." And this honestly is a new thought for me, one that has been offered to me by my 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 personal co- my personal coach, Kameen Samuel, and I, I realize I failed to consider the cooperative nature with the universe or with the divine. What what are your thoughts on this really interesting sta- statement? What you want wants you. Do you do you have thoughts on that? I do. Um... First of all, um, I actually teared up when Adam sent me that forward. I was, I, it, I just thought it's beautiful, um, and it, it was phenomenal what he wrote. Um, and I do believe what you want wants you. Let me give a great example. At least I think it's a great example. I found it necessary to complete my marriage uh, a little now, 10 and a half years ago. And I knew that there truly was somebody in my world that God had chosen. I actually would have said God and my two dads, my, my biological father and my stepfather. I believe they co-conspired. I knew in my heart of hearts that there was still somebody for me. And I, like many things, <laughs> I think I, w- I have been my toughest client with my own process. And, um, and so I never worried about how or who or when. I knew it would happen. I just knew. And I knew that that person ultimately was also wanting a relationship as well. How that was going to come about wasn't really my business to try to completely figure out, but I did things to position myself. And in fact, and the story is in the book, but a, a couple of my girlfriends actually had an intervention with me. One of my girlfriends, we were speaking at an event, and they said, we want to talk to you later. And I'm like, okay. And... um But there was just a little something in the request that made me a bit suspicious. And so we all got together at the end of our day. And they said, they said, the reason we wanted to get together is we want you to start dating again. And, and it was actually really, and I'm like, okay. (laughs) And it was really very sweet. And they also said, and we want to take you shopping. And I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, I think I dress okay. So, and we had a phenomenal time. And so they encouraged me to create an online profile. And I literally had a conversation with God. And I said, God, you and I both know that the likelihood I'm going to meet somebody online is like practically nil. However, 
I'm showing you this, that I'm open to receive because I don't know how this is to come about. So I did sign up for an online, um, one of the online dating services. And I got to tell you, (laughs) it was not very successful in terms of meeting men my age. A lot of men much older than me were interested in me. So so I had on my calendar the day that that membership ended, and we were coming pretty close to that um, because I, I also don't like to just throw my money away. I get an email, and the email, you know, seems nice. I check out this guy's profile. Well, he looks pretty good. I read his profile, and I'm thinking, well, he's literate. He's, he can write pretty well. He was supposedly age appropriate, and I'm I'm not um, I'm not proud to say this, but it's a, it is a byproduct of the world that we live in. There was a part of me that went, oh, I hope he's not a scammer, because there are a lot of impersonators out there, unfortunately. And so we end up emailing, and uh, we get on the phone the next day. We have a conversation. It was neither one of us remember the conversation, but we made plans to meet the next day for a coffee. And it was very pleasant. There were no fireworks. It wasn't like, oh, he's the one. But I have to say there was something inside of me that thought, well, was he nervous or, you know, it was more, I think you should give this guy another chance. So we meet now, I don't know how many days later, we have a meal and halfway through the meal, I'm finding myself curious. I find myself engaged. Again, you know, I didn't know if we were in the friend zone or if there was really a connection. And so then we make plans for another date. And I, once again, I'm saying, okay, God, give me a, hopefully there's a little clue here, you know, does, what, what's going on. And I will have, I have to admit, John showed up completely different. I'm like, where was this guy all along? You know, he was outgoing and animated. He has turned out to be the love of my life. So I kind of eat my words because I never thought I would meet somebody online. Um, but I did, and I'm grateful for it. And so that's a really good example. And I even think for people in business, the same is true. You know, we all have our own unique gifts and talents and skills. And there are people that are wanting and needing what you And only you can offer, and I want you to have faith that you just need to find ways to find each other and to be open, you know, open to get um, assistance. You know, you mentioned you have a coach, um, open to maybe hire somebody to help you in social media or marketing. Uh, You have to be, you have to be good at discerning. There are a lot of people out there, but I do believe, obviously, in that phrase. That makes, you know, I, I, I like that phrase a lot. Um, I, have a, um, I have a practical question for you. You have so many different stories of clientele. And I'm, I'm curious because I've, I've dealt with this not on a professional level, but on a personal level quite a bit. What do you, how do you advise someone who feels like they have an unattainable desire or goal, say, as a a woman is getting a bit older, a life partner, or maybe a career as they're younger. I I have no idea what my career. What kinds of strategies do you offer people that have, I'm calling them seemingly unattainable desires or goals? Where, Where do they even begin Well, first of all, you know, I have a very unique system, and because of my accident, I opened up, and I have gifts um, and and transformational processes that I can use to to kind of wake up those desires again, to start to have people believe that things are possible. Now, 
That being said, so somebody, for example, that wants a partner in life, I believe it really is possible. Just like I shared with you, it may not happen tomorrow, but I know it can happen. And it's my job to help you get clear and position yourself in a way to have the welcome mat out, shall we say. And as far as a career, again, I believe it it's something that you really want, it's possible. Now, if somebody says, okay, I want you to help me win the, the lottery. So we're going to look at things also a little bit on the realistic side. Uh, first of all, I can't promise any result with my client. Um, right. But what I do tell my clients kind of tongue-in-cheek, is, you know, in a lot of ways I've been given a magic wand, but I do not have a crystal ball. So I really don't know what results you're going to accomplish or by when. But what I am hoping for is that you are not going to be the one that screws up my success rate. So in that sense, you know, it's like I've been fortunate that I've seen people have miraculous lives. So getting back to your point, there is a bit of realism in the work, but maybe if they come to me and say they want to win the lottery, I'm going to say, yeah, I don't know if we can do that. You might, um, but I'm not going to put my personal money on it. Right. However, I want you to feel like you have won the lottery of life. Oh, that's great. So I have another question for you. I, I, I have a handful of just off-the-wall questions as I was reading your book. Um, and, and I like this one. Based on your life experience, Wendy, if you could offer advice to your younger self, what would be some key advice that you would give yourself? And, that, and that, so that, that fits for our younger audience and our whole sure. audience. Well, first of all, I want you to know how very special you are. You're gifted, you're bright, you're talented, you're beautiful, and you will not even believe what's going to happen in your future. Let's stop right there. How do we, there are people that have very contrary beliefs on that. Well, what is the process of restructuring, redesigning okay. that? Well, you know, I believe we can talk to our inner child, and I believe sometimes that's very important. I grew up in an environment where my mother was highly critical, and she was both physically and emotionally abusive. I did not know who I was. I did not know anything about anything special about me. I was never okay. Anything that I did always was met with criticism or it needed to be different. And that type of behavior erodes on an individual's identity and self-confidence. And it has taken me quite a journey to discover who I really am. Um, and it, it has been, a, it was a process. I'm still discovering at the age of 70. That's not the bad news. Oh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. I've got my life plan till 80. I know next year I'm a month in Europe, and years after that I'm two to three months a year in Europe. As I'm growing older, I'm going to spend my time where I want to spend my time. And right. So I can write, I can think, I can travel, I can learn new cultures that that is that's essential for me you know there are different exercises that i've experienced throughout my journey you know where and this piece that you just brought up of talking to your younger self is really very important it can create a lot of healing to parent that young girl or boy that really never got what they needed at the time and in doing so, there really is a level of healing that can take place. Because a lot of times we have experiences that keep repeating itself. Now, 
I'm blessed that I have a process that stops that from happening. But when things are repeating, in a lot of ways, it's that wound from the past that's raising its hand that never got acknowledged, that never got taken care of. And it's asking to be taken care of. So if you're noticing that kind of repetition, take a step back and love. Listen to what is being said from within. Talk to that young child that still lives within you, that has a heartache, that has never been held and taken care of and healed. Well, I'll tell you, that that sort of wraps up our time as we're, we're nearing end. Wendy, you have, um, I am captivated by your wisdom and your creative appetite and, and your creative ideas. You have so much to offer the world. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for saying that. And it's been an absolute pleasure and thank, delight. Thank you. Now... We have, you know, I'll have your book on, you know, that will be on the show notes. Do I put um, Miraculous Living Institute on your show notes as well? Sure. Or it's very simple. My website's wendydarling.com. So thank you once again. It, it's, it's, it's been a delight. And I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And please be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. And until next... This is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.